Today's topic is supporting and visiting Vinaya Monastic as a Buddhist society. We specially requested this uh, topic so that uh, we can help to support the Sangha better. It's uh, basically it's a context of the Vinaya for a monk, how we meet with monks, significance of uh, the Vinaya, skillful attitude and means towards the monk, practical guidelines in regards to providing transport, offering dana, accommodation, etc. Okay. So Ayasma Vibhuta Damika originated from the Netherlands. When he met some of life's challenges, he was blessed to come across the teaching of the Buddha. Inspired in confidence, he then set out to Sri Lanka and eventually ended up ordaining as a bhikkhu under Ayasma Arya Damika in SBS, Sasanaraka, Taipei, in 2020. Ayasma Vibhuta Damika makes an ongoing effort to balance studies of the Dhamma, Vinaya, and Pali, and supporting the Sangha in keeping up with mental, bodily, and verbal actions as skillful as possible at all times. So let us uh, put our palms together to invite Bhante for Dhamma sharing. Over to you, Bhante. Um, testing, testing. Yeah. Is it okay? Maybe, Bobby, I have one more question for you before you begin. And maybe, Tanutomo, you want to sit in the front as well? Okay. No, no need to push if he's comfortable. Yeah, just. Uh, so, uh, maybe one question first to Bobby. So, Bobby invited me if I want to share a few words today. And uh, you already gave a, a nice introduction. But maybe also, if you would be willing, could you share a bit from your own words? So, you made a request to me if I can share a bit today. Also, maybe from your own words, like, why, when would you be satisfied today? Like, what is your interest in hearing a bit more about this topic? Maybe from your own experience, would you like to share? Like, maybe some of the challenges that you sometimes face in that yeah, I, after I, today, it will all be, yeah. all be good. <laughs> yeah, I believe uh, many of you, including myself, was uh, am, uh, a bit, uh, <clears throat> have question marks in our minds, like, uh, if uh, we come and alone and offer dana as a lady, is it possible? Will it be breaking the Vinaya rules? So questions like this, uh, do, do uh, a lady have to be accompanied by a guy when they all come to the center to offer dana? And also things like uh, if we come and fetch a monk, can a lady go and fetch a monk, lady driver? Let's say uh, we don't have transports, transporter, then uh, Bhante uh, needs transport pick up from uh, maybe a temple, another center. Can a lady come alone? Or can two ladies pick up Bhante? So, things like... Uh, you are a man, Bobby. Huh? You are a man, no? Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm talking about ladies. Uh. That's why I work a crop, mainly ladies. Uh. I think so, so, questions like... Uh, things like this, uh, especially pertaining to ladies. Yeah, so what I hear, Bobby, is that Bobby is helping out a lot with BGF, and then uh, BGF has invited monks from SBS to come over from time to time. So in my case, I've been having some medical, or how to say, I've been having an injury on my leg, so then it's very helpful. Better? Can you hear well in the back? Test, test. Uh, testing, testing, better? Can you hear me in the back? Thumbs up? <laughs> so in my case, for example, uh, it's very helpful to be in KL because I can get some proper physiotherapy and yeah, a lot of support that is available here. And sometimes the monks from SBS, they will come for the same reason, so maybe some treatment. Or sometimes we are traveling to other places and we spend some time here in KL. Um, I never know if I can say KL because I know technically we're not in KL. Uh, Klang Valley, would that be appropriate in, in the KL area? And so in this case, I understand from Bobby as well. Bobby is helping out with BJF and trying to support the monks. And uh, then, of course, some doubts or some uncertainties can arise. And I've seen it also the last weeks I've been here in the area, and I can see indeed that sometimes this can happen. Some uncertainties or some doubts and some questions arise. And uh, so I think today I will do my best to share a bit, maybe also help you a bit more to kind of get into a mind of a monk who is following the Vinaya, to maybe help you also find a bit more ease and kind of confidence when there are monks visiting. Um, so that, that's a bit my idea today. I think. Uh, so first there will be a talk where I will share some, some ideas that are on the mind and then also we have some time for Q&A. So it would be best if, if you have any questions to maybe save them for at the end of the talk. Uh, if you can remember them, you can even write them down if you want. Uh, 
because some of the questions might be answered in the talk already. Um, yeah, so I wanted to stress that, like, otherwise, yeah, to uh, do my best to share uh, on Bobby's request, and that will be really the intent, I think, after the talk, then we can be happy if all of you feel maybe a little bit more confident again, and, uh, and I think sometimes it comes from a little bit of explanation how the Vinaya works, how is it for a monk to practice the Vinaya, can sometimes give a bit more clarity and confidence, and then, yeah. So I think in the talk there are a few kind of themes or topics that I would like to touch on. So I think the first one I would like to maybe just share a bit, how is it as a monk to practice the Vinaya, and why do we do that to begin with? Um, so maybe more from the experience of a monk, how is that to practice in the Vinaya? And uh, afterward, maybe I would like to say as well something for how is it for a layperson, for you as laity, to meet monks, and what can be some ideas that you keep in mind, or how to relate to it in a way that's also for yourself helpful and skillful. Um, and then also partly I would like to go a little bit deeper into maybe just some very practical examples, like some of the uh, kind of uh, experiences we have together, the, how to say, kind of the events that we have together, like offering dana, and maybe sitting down like we do now. And then I will also share a bit in a very practical way what are some of the kind of relevant Vinaya rules uh, so that you also maybe gain a bit more clarity there. And, and yeah, again, I think for me the main goal, I'm not, yeah, maybe I can say some. Yeah, I think so for me the main goal that we can be happy if again there's a little bit more clarity. So just also yeah, maybe to get started with that. So the Vinaya is a complicated topic. <laughs> uh, the, yeah, the texts that are there available from the time of the Buddha and also the commentaries from a later time, it's a very big uh, body of text. So even for us as monks, like we really make an effort to train. So partially when we start uh, to become monks, we take time to read the Vinaya and study it and also put it into practice. So it's also reasonable that for you, it might be more difficult to know some of the details because there are many details. <laughs> even for us as monks, when we really make an effort, there are some challenges that we have and it takes time to really learn it. So also just to kind of manage the expectations after this uh, 40 minutes, one hour, one hour and a half, you will not be a Vinaya expert, but that's also not really necessary, I think. So maybe I would like to just start with see, saying something about why, I cannot of course speak for all the monks, <laughs> but I can do my best to say something that seems uh, maybe generalizable for uh, many monks. Uh, so why do we even, to begin with, uh, practice in the Vinaya? So I think the way you can relate to it as laity is that also I think many of you, who of you are undertaking the five precepts? You did it just before, no? This morning still. Yeah. I mean, of course, like the recitation is one thing, but the, the keeping it up every day to try to not break the precepts and uh, that is the real practice. And uh, so besides the five precepts, maybe from time to time, either on Uposita or maybe when you're doing a retreat, you might undertake maybe the eight precepts, 10 precepts sometimes maybe even 10 precepts temporarily. So I think that the way to relate to the monk's rules is that the, the eight precepts are already considered a very high level of virtue. If you can always maintain the eight precepts, or maybe even the 10, but especially already the eight, that's already a very high level of virtue. Um, so as monks, we are practicing even more precepts. So we follow the Patimokka rules, which are 227 rules, and we are following many small rules. I think it's like thousands of rules. but it would not be proper to say that then the monks, their sila is a hundred times better than somebody who follows the eight precepts. Um, I think the eight precepts are still really the core also for the monks. So, but for the monks, some of the rules are like split up in more detail. And there are also additional rules that are not per se to do with uh, wholesomeness and unwholesomeness. So maybe I can say a bit more about that as well. So, I think for many of us monks, when we ordain as monks, we, how you can look at the Vinaya is almost as if you would take a job and you would uh, uh, become an employee of an employer, you would sign a certain contract. So if you would want to work for a certain company in a certain job, they might offer you benefits, maybe a certain salary, and maybe you would like to work there, but also they have some expectations. There might be some limitations. It might not be that you say, okay, I, I signed a contract, I get the salary, but the whole day I sit in the office and just watch television. That will probably not work so well. So in a, you can relate in a similar way to the Vinaya for monks. So when we ordain as monks, as you can imagine, there are many types of monks. Even there might be monks in different religions, maybe Christianity. Uh, that it's also not uncommon. Uh, 
And then, as monks, we particularly become monks in the system of the Vinaya. Sorry? A higher, like this. Not so used to using a microphone like this. Um, thank you for telling me. <laughs> um, so it's a bit as you start to work for an employer and you kind of take on that package of those regulations. So in a way, when we become a bhikkhu, we b become a bhikkhu in the context of the Vinaya. So personally, for me, when I wanted to ordain, I took it quite serious to study the Vinaya. And actually, I was a little bit nervous, to be honest, <laughs> because I knew that if I would be a monk, I would take on the Vinaya as a practice. So it would not be that I would ordain as a monk and I say like, oh yeah, this I do, that I don't do. So for me, there was some nervousness. And when I read all of it, I felt quite happy uh, because I had the sense that I can take this on and it seems very balanced and uh, very appropriate. And so then, so part of the reason I think as monks we take on the Vinaya is because it strengthens, strengthens us in our resolve to keep good sila. So especially a lot of the rules has still to do with skillful and unskillful states. So for example, some training rules about not lying or not stealing. And uh, I think to have the same as when you undertake the precepts, you do that together and you really kind of make, have also a bit of social kind of uh, social system around it. Uh, it strengthens the resolve and it helps you to be clear about that. So I think many monks, they in the basis, they are interested in keeping that level of sila and then the vinaya and ordaining as a monk can really help in that. At the same time, there are also many rules that are more kind of procedural. So for example, there are quite some rules about how, how does the ordination work? Maybe similar when you uh, apply for a job at a, at a company, there might be some procedures that need to be followed to make sure that uh, the taxation is done in an appropriate way. So maybe it's not, um, in that case, it doesn't have to do per se with wholesome or unwholesome, but it is still important as kind of a legal setup then to determine like when are you properly ordained. Uh, so things there are, for example, important to avoid that uh, somebody who is uh, 10 years old could ordain. Like we, that's something that is avoided, uh, rather somebody who is old enough to ordain. And then also some rules have more to do with kind of the perception of the laity. So some things that we might do might not per se be unskillful or unwholesome, but still if people see us do it, they might not be inspired. So there are also quite some rules that have to do with certain behaviors to also keep, make sure that all the monks that are monks have uh, keep a good perception of the monks uh, alive as well. Because of course many types of people ordain Many, I'm sure, have very wholesome intentions, but also for some, the, the wholesome intentions might be less purified. So they, they might benefit, or the Sangha as a whole might benefit from certain rules of conduct. And, uh, and so some rules also really have to do with, for example, we maintain to stay together with our three ropes. So if, for example, I have one of my ropes, my upper rope or my double rope, and I would just leave it somewhere behind, then I could get an offense for that. And so technically, it doesn't need to be unwholesome because I might just forget. So some rules for the monks have also to just do with, sometimes you might forget something, you can also get an offense. So to summarize it, some of the rules are for us as monks really to help us be skillful and wholesome, but also some to kind of organize the Sangha in a way that we have a good way to living together and we can stay harmonious. Yeah. So then, yeah, one thing is also that for me personally, or any monk who takes on the Vinaya, in the very basis, it's our own responsibility to make sure we maintain the Vinaya. What that means is that we, whenever we make an offense, it's up to us to confess the offense. Uh, so, like we ourselves keep an eye on ourselves in a way. <laughs> and uh, then whenever there's an offense, we would confess it to another and make it open in that way. And that can be a way... Uh, that can be a way as well to strengthen our resolve. So if we have make an offense, we make it open and thereby we purify and we, we continue again on the practice. And but so also when we when we meet laity, it is good to realize that as monks we should also we have the responsibility for our own sila, for our own vinaya. And so also ideally, although it might not always be the case, we also try to learn and to be skillful in also speaking up when something happens and and it might not be it might it might potentially lead to us breaking the Vinaya. So if we meet you as laity, and there might be a situation where uh, a situation is coming up where something would happen that would lead us to make an offense, then we should also be skillful to speak up and say, hey, let's, let's speak about this and let's try to do it in another way. Of course, we can maintain friendliness. It doesn't need to be a conflict. But in that way also, it can be an assurance for you as well that it's always good to kind of, to know that you can help, but the monk ideally should also feel confident to share and speak up and also be able to educate you 
in that sense that it's not a, per se your responsibility to make sure you're very learned in the Vinaya. Of course, every little bit you learn is helpful and very positive, but also to not take on too much of that pressure for yourself and see what is reasonable. So I think that brings me maybe to a broader question of like, how do you relate to monks? And uh, so I think one point that I've now been trying to make a little bit is that the study of the Vinaya, yeah, maybe one more thing I want to say about that. So when we study the Vinaya, it's also not just a study topic. It's a bit maybe, I, I, I've been thinking about the simile in my mind of maybe, for example, learning yoga. So when you learn yoga, it might be that you go to a class or you look on videos online, or maybe you even read books. For me, when I started to do some yoga, I actually used a lot of book where I could uh, read some something. And of course, with picture, pictures as well, <laughs> how to do certain postures. But then also, it's not just the learning because you can like study a lot and read a lot and have a lot of intellectual knowledge about yoga. But if you've never done yoga, it's still something else. Um, so then it is always like partly the study, but also putting it into practice. So for us as monks, it might take a while before we put certain rules into practice and we try and we see maybe how do we actually understand it when we put it in practice. Uh, so that might also take some time for a monk and it's really a lived practice in that way, like we really need to put it into practice. Uh, which is also a reason why as a, for a lay person, there might also be some limitations in, it is more difficult if you haven't lived that, uh, if, if you haven't put it into practice yourself. So again, I, I think I say this to also kind of try to ease your mind a bit and see what is reasonable to expect uh, for yourself and to still like do the best you can within that, but also see that yeah, there might be some limitations. Uh, yeah, that, that's how it, how it naturally will be just to kind of ease your mind in that. So maybe one more thing then about how to, more kind of general ideas of how to relate as laity to monks. So uh, one thing that I've noticed a lot here and that I find very praiseworthy, and I think sometimes we do these things and we, we see them as very normal, but actually if you think about it, it's quite wholesome and quite uh, skillful. Uh, namely that it's very helpful for monks if we come into a new environment, if at least people invite us or say that, hey, you know, if there's something that we can do better or we can do in a different way to support uh, your practice of Vinaya, please let us know. And uh, that is all very, already very important because, as I already said, as monks we should feel confident to bring up topics, but it does help a lot if people also acknowledge themselves and make themselves open for feedback. Uh, generally, it makes, for myself, I can notice, I've heard it here a lot, and it's very supportive uh, that if there are certain things that I think would help me more, that I, uh, I I'm also feel okay to just ask about it and uh, we can discuss it together. So I think that that's likewise for the monks, a very important quality to make yourself open for admonishment. Uh, even though it doesn't always need to be admonishment, it can also just be like sharing together and figuring out how can we do this together in a proper way. Again, also from the understanding that there might be some limitations in uh, your depth of uh, Vinaya, uh, that you're not the Vinaya experts. <laughs> not even most of the monks are, so that's to be expected. So I think that's something to be just praised for a moment and also to realize how good that is, how skillful that is. And I think yeah, why I say it is that it can easily be quite different. I've sometimes, uh, I'm, I'm sometimes familiar with how it goes in the West when monks go to the West. And uh, of course, some of the monasteries that are there, they have a lot of uh, uh, Sri Lankans or Thai people supporting them. And uh, so then it's still very similar, but for us Westerners, if Westerners hear about Buddhism, they, the attitude might sometimes be a bit different. They would more sometimes be confused, why, why don't you just take care of your own food? <laughs> so then also, yeah, I've seen it sometimes in contact with family, that yeah, there's a, sometimes a different attitude towards, uh, they wouldn't say, oh, how can we support you in your Vinaya? They rather ask, like, oh, how can you take care of yourself? <laughs> Which is also like quite deep in our culture. It has also benefits, like we are, can be quite self-sufficient, but... Yeah, it is a very praiseworthy quality to like ask, like, how can I support and how can we do this together in a good way? Uh, so that is something that is praiseworthy. But I think, yeah, that is, that those are my thoughts more in general. So I think, again, like, to realize that the Vinaya, it is quite deep. And uh, also for us monks, it takes time to train in it. And then for your part, it's also not to be expected that you will know all the details, uh, but especially to make yourself open and also be curious. I have one other aspect that I've seen here, which I find very good is also, which for me I was sometimes a bit worried about sometimes beforehand that uh, also you receive maybe monks from different places, different traditions, and we might also sometimes have different interpretations. <laughs> Generally we try to adjust, especially when it's not 
yeah, it's, it's generally on rules that are not, where it makes sense that there can be different interpretations and neither is particularly right or wrong. For example, with or the offering of food, maybe we can get into it later, um, there can be different understandings of what, like how do you properly offer food. And I've seen here also that there seems a certain, how to say, openness also to seeing like, oh yeah, there are different traditions and they do it in different ways. And also to really ask the monk, like, oh, how, how is it for you to, you understood. And uh, also for myself, if I'm with other monks and they practice in a different way, I, I likewise, especially on those rules where, uh, to my understanding, especially within the Theravada tradition, the tradition, the, most of the differences are quite small. So we try to always bridge those differences and adjust to each other because the harmony is just very important in that way. Yeah, I think those, those are maybe more like my general comments, both from my own perspective as a bhikkhu or just the bhikkhus in general, and also some ideas for you in general, like when you meet a monk, what are good things to maybe just your general attitude or how to say, like to kind of in a way keep it relaxed and stay open and be also perceptive. And I think, oh yeah, maybe one more aspect that comes to mind that's quite nice is that uh, I also just want to say that I was quite glad to hear uh, the request for the for the topic made by Bobby because I think it is something very important, especially from the perspective that for the for the longevity of the sasana, it is very important that we find good ways to support each other. So not just from the laity to the monks, but also yeah, both ways. So I think the better we can kind of have understanding and support for each other to make sure we have supportive conditions for both, I think that can be very wholesome and very yeah, positive for the longevity of the sasana. So I think it's very good that we discuss these things and also again, maybe from the attitude of like trying to understand each other and how can we support the practice for both in such a good as possible way. Yeah. So I think that's very wholesome and so I'm glad that I can hopefully maybe share some ideas that can maybe be of support uh, here and there. Yeah. Um, so then maybe the final topic that's now on my mind is just to go into to some kind of uh, common situations that we meet together <laughs> and then just share kind of from the perspective of the Vinaya, what are relevant rules that are there? And also, again, to help maybe understand sometimes some of the things the monks might do or ask. <laughs> and also to just, yeah, have a bit more clarity again so that you can also feel confident in that situation that, uh, yeah, that you understand what's going on. <laughs> and then afterwards we can go to Q&A and then we see what, I'm sure there might be some questions remaining. So I think maybe the first two situations that I would like to discuss, so maybe we make it a bit into a story, like that's kind of a, or how to say it, like a scenario that is quite common. So let's say in your case, when you're here in BGF, then sometimes monks might be arriving. Sometimes they might come with an airplane or with a train or with a car or anyways, they come to KL in some way. And then, so the first topic maybe to discuss is just uh, about transport. Uh, so I think maybe two rules that we monks, uh, uh, make take care of uh, are in in relation to the one is in relation to the organizing of transport and uh, so in that case one of the things that is good to be aware of is that generally as monks we're not allowed to make uh, to make an arrangement to travel together with a woman so even if you would be willing to support the monk to bring him to the hospital or let's say there's nothing urgent that's aside from urgent things uh, yeah, in urgent cases, generally you also don't make an arrangement beforehand. It happens generally quite quick. But uh, let's say you would like to help a monk and to go to, for myself, I've been going to physiotherapy. So maybe you want to offer to a monk to bring him to the physiotherapy. And then in that case, uh, it's good to be aware that as monks, we're not allowed to make an arrangement with a woman uh, to travel together. So, and in that case, sometimes it might also, it's sometimes difficult to express as well. So in that case, the monk might be a bit like, oh, better maybe not do it, but... Yeah, sometimes difficult to express or explain at that time. Uh, so generally, we make arrangements with a man to travel if we need to go somewhere. Um, then there's another rule that also we're not supposed to, that's a separate rule, that we're not supposed to travel together with a woman. Uh, there's some more detail to that because I've had, for example, cases where um, where somebody helped me to go to uh, to a treatment, and then in that case, I made an arrangement with him together he came to pick me up and his wife was also in the car. And in that case, that is okay. Uh, so we're not supposed to travel just alone with a woman, but if there's a man present, that is okay. As long as you don't make the arrangement together beforehand. So in that case, I didn't know his, his, uh, his wife was coming along. Uh, so that was a surprise. I didn't know about it. 
And in that case, also because there's a man present in the car, that's also okay. Um, so in general, I think like some of these rules are also to kind of be careful with our own defilements, but also to make sure that it can also look a bit funny for somebody who is an outsider. They see a monk traveling around with a woman, and it generally looks a bit different than traveling around with a man. So again, there we can see as well the principle that we try to be a bit careful both for our own defilements, but also to keep uh, to avoid confusion, basically, or to avoid that there might be... I'm trying to remember in the Buddha's time what was the occasion for this rule. I think, if I remember correctly, it was uh, monks and nuns traveling together. And then, uh, in that case, there were monks and nuns traveling together, and the people said, like, oh, wow, they just look like couples. They're just, like, traveling like that. <laughs> and, and it might have been just a very wholesome occasion. I think, actually, it wasn't. I think they were going to some like festivities or something, not per se like going to the hospital or something like that. But so that's an example where we try to be a bit careful with how does it look. Even it might be that there are no ill intentions and it's really skillful, but we try to be kind of extra careful in that that case. So then let's say we're still in our scenario. So the monk has been picked up from KL Central or from the airport, and now coming to VGF. So. There are again two rules there that are maybe relevant to know about. And so one of the rules is again relating to women. So in that case, uh, as monks, we generally uh, do not lay down in one building together with women. So it would be, there are some details to it. So generally, you can see sometimes in Buddhist societies that there might be uh, lay retreats going on, and then there might also be women in a, in a nearby building or same building, so that we avoid. And one, one way is that it can also sometimes be avoided is that, for example, in Bubs is a good example, they have one room where it's still kind of in the building, but it's sealed off on the inside, and the uh, entrance is different. So even though there's the same roof, they have a different exit, so it's in a way a different building in that way. So then sometimes that can be helpful for monks to be able to stay there, and then, but still, of course, we try to avoid that. Yeah, generally, we try to stay just with monks if we can, uh, sometimes. Yeah, again, also a bit uh, the, the same per perception is that sometimes monks, how to say, for example, when we visit our families, then the family might also expect that, oh, but you can just move back into your room, right? Uh, but also there it is a bit odd for the per perception of people towards monks. Like, what are these monks? Like, they just live together with their parents. And it, it might create some confusion on yeah, what is the idea of being a monk, basically. If, we, uh, if I live with my mother and she's taking care of me, then... So then that's one rule, and another one is also about laying down with men as well. So generally we also avoid that, although there is an allowance that if you wake up before dawn, if you get out of bed before dawn, uh, that, it, that it's okay, even though still we try to avoid it. That It might be, for example, in a retreat situation where there's a monk teaching lay, laity, that there might also be men in the same building, but we, you could technically get up before dawn, but also there we try to avoid it. Uh, if I remember correctly, in the Vinaya, there's a story where the monks lay down with uh, the laity, with some uh, men, young men, I think, and then they were just snoring and uh, making many sounds in their sleep. And the, and the people saw them like it was already the dawn had arisen, it was light, and the monks were still like sleeping and tossing around together with uh, all the other people. And the peop yeah, people had a bit of the perception of what are these monks? Like they're just like lolling around in sleep, and it doesn't look very inspiring. Yeah. So yeah, do, those two rules are, are good to be aware of when monks are being hosted somewhere in KL. Uh, also, that's why generally we, we like to stay in societies like this where uh, yeah, there are not many other people living rather than we would. For example, as monks, if we would travel, it would be difficult to stay in a hotel, for example, because generally there are many people around and uh, yeah, you all share the same entrance. So that's something that generally we avoid. And anyways, we try, of course, we like also to stay with other monks. That's always nice. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So that's, uh, I think, what's relevant in regard to accommodation. And then another topic, so again, we are still doing the same story. The monk has arrived now from the airport or from KL Central or from anywhere. Now they have arrived in BJF and are staying here. And then I think two more kind of scenarios that are often happening is that there's an offering of dana. So that's a moment that we share together. 
and as well maybe just like either like now or after the dana sometimes we sit down together and maybe there's some anamodana or some chanting or maybe sometimes q a or dhamma talk like this and there are also some rules there that are kind of good to maybe refresh um just to try and again give a bit more explanation and understanding so i think maybe the offering of food is always the most complicated in a way <laughs> which is quite interesting uh, i think also just that yeah maybe it's one of the more impactful contact moments we have sometimes that is the only moment where the laity and the monks meet so i think maybe also the reason why there's a bit more rules in that area um and so yeah maybe also there we just go through it a little bit step by step so as you have might have noticed i think who of you have been here last week offering dana can you show your hands yeah quite a few of you <laughs> and um so i think like when we offer dana generally we also have discussed a bit with some of you uh, who were here and uh, i think you might be aware of some of the differences in understanding sometimes so one of the things where there's some some difference of understanding is that uh, how to offer the food so there are different interpretations like some they would say that if you offer the whole table that is okay uh, generally we make sure that it's completely lifted also some they would say if you touch the table that's enough um some they prefer to offer the separate dishes and i think this partly this comes from in the vinaya itself um there's not not that much detail so for example when it comes to offering dish by dish this is something that has been added later by the commentary so we have the original vinaya text and then often over time commentaries have accumulated of topics that were maybe not always clear so then the commentaries try to kind of fill it in and explain like but how to do it exactly and so there might the difference i think often come from there where some monks they might then follow that commentary and some they might not do it so then there might be some small differences here and there why some monks they would offer the whole table and others might do it dish by dish anyway i think we discussed it that it seemed yeah most helpful to kind of see with the monk like what is his interpretation and then you can see that like abs- absolutely speaking it's not that either one is right or wrong it's just that we can see differences in monks some might prefer to stay a bit more with the original vinaya text and some they stay more with one or another commentary as well uh so i think there yeah we can see that with the offering of food there's some some differences maybe one topic that's also interesting in this case that i notice especially when we offer dish by dish that can be a bit challenging is that it's good and we need to find a bit of a balance here but it's also one of the parts of the vinaya is that also when we get food offered we make sure that we are in hands reach arms reach sorry um so one thing that sometimes happens especially if there's a table and you're offering that you might offer really from the other side of the table like that and uh, that is sometimes easily happens but it's good to be avoided and to try to be kind of close enough uh, but of course we also try to like keep a bit our distance to not be too close either so that's sometimes a bit of a balancing act but that's sometimes challenging that's the benefit of offering the whole table then for me as a monk i just need to make sure once that i'm uh, close enough to at least one of the people um but especially with dish to dish that's important to kind of do it close enough uh to to make sure that yeah, we 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 stay within that arms reach yeah that's an important part of it so another rule that's interesting and it's also a good example of uh, where the buddha adjusted really the way the monks practiced towards the ideas in the society to make sure that the monks were doing things that fitted in also the perceptions and the expectations of the people especially for something that is not uh, problematic for the holy life so in this case in the time of the buddha there was the belief that it's a bit difficult actually to put it into words i realize because so it's in regard to plants and they had the idea that there was a certain soul or something in that plant as well and in a way i think we can relate to it it also we ourselves i think we see plants as something living like they're growing and they're living and although i think for i think the buddhist understanding is that because the plants do not feel pain we don't let's say if we see somebody cut maybe some leaves or they cut the tree i mean on some level it can still sometimes be a bit painful to see maybe it's a nice tree and we generally like nature but we don't like worry about all oh, the tree is suffering a lot of pain um but in the buddha's time people had a bit that concern it seemed also to be related to maybe to devas or beings that lived in the trees uh, beings that we might not be able to see with the naked eye and then so for example in the buddha's time this belief was there and then sometimes the monks they would cut the plants and then the people would criticize and they would say like wow these monks are just cutting the trees down and 
they're not taking care of, uh, of the life that is in the trees. And so in this case, we have this, still today, uh, we have this uh, practice where, um, so sometimes we do it before the offering, but it can also be done in the bowl, one time for whatever is there, whatever is connected in the bowl, is that we make uh, plants, we make food allowable. So what we do is like, as a monk, I say, Kapiyam uh, Karohi, and you would say, you would damage it in some way and say Kapiyam Bante. And what it means is that I say, make it allowable, and you damage it, and thereby make it allowable. And the idea is that in the Buddha's time, that was perceived as something good to do, to make sure that whatever beings lived in that plant, uh, they're not there anymore, and you can kind of eat it without any problem. <laughs> so maybe sometimes for us, more difficult to relate to, because we don't live in that society where those ideas were there. But uh, still maybe a nice principle that we kind of recollect that yeah, plant life and seeds. So it is specifically in regard to plants and seeds that we, if we would put them in the ground, it might be that they can grow again. So if something is, for example, cooked or the seeds are removed, then there's no need for it. But so it, it depends on the perception of the monk. Like <laughs> um, as a monk, you can become a little bit of a biologist as well in that way. Uh, so when we are offering food, for me, I have a look like which things do I think might be able to grow. Of course, I don't always know. I'm not a, I'm not a biologist, but yeah. I mean, if you if you study and practice the Vinaya, you can become expert expert. You become an, an expert in many many different things. So you might get quite knowledgeable about what can grow and what cannot grow again. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So then maybe yeah to avoid maybe also kind of enough ideas like maybe maybe just one more is in regard to the relinquishing of food. It's also an interesting topic. And actually also one where, for a good reason, there are different interpretations. <laughs> and so generally, how we have done it here in BGF is that after the food has been offered, uh, generally, at least for myself, in SBS, we are used to just, we collect food one time, and then we put it somewhere else and we eat there. So we generally, we, we avoid sitting on a table and like eating from there uh, can be a bit more inviting because, oh, maybe I need to eat this and I need to eat this. <laughs> and then you... Yeah, it's generally a bit more easy to stay restrained and just collect one time what you need, and then you sit down, and that's also enough. <laughs> and then, but still, it's not always like clear. It depends also a bit how we do it together when food is uh, considered relinquished, because I think often it depends from place to place. But it's not uncommon that, of course, like the amount of food that's being offered, um, I can only eat so much, <laughs> and I, I can surely not eat all that is offered here. I will also not try. But then there's always some leftovers, and the question is sometimes like, when when is it really an offered? And it's actually quite a good question and not so straightforward. <laughs> uh, and it depends also a bit how we do it together. So I think how we have done it here is that sometimes you might ask. So generally, one way to do it is that you can, if we would be here and we would know after a while that ah, yeah, the monks that are there, they collect one, so afterward it is considered relinquished. That would be one way. But if you're not sure, you can also ask. And to be sure, like Albante, is there... Uh, what about the food? And then the monk would, could also say, like, make make some speech and saying that, ah, yeah, you can consider it as relinquished, so feel free to do with the food as you wish. <laughs> um, so it depends also on the monks. So some monks, they would like to do that. They say some words to, to reassure the people, or sometimes we can have also an understanding between us that once I've collected, uh, it's relinquished, it's considered relinquished. And so there are also in that area different ways, and it might depend on the individual monk how to do it. So... I think indeed there's maybe no harm in just asking just to be sure and making sure that what you're doing is proper. Yeah, I think maybe that's what's on my mind. I hope it wasn't too tedious. Uh, I thought just maybe some details to share. And But I, yeah, I do still believe, and I want to come back to that first point that I made in the very beginning, that I think especially just uh, kind of an open attitude and what you I think you already do it, so I would wish to... Just praise that and uh, how to say motivate support motivate you to keep doing that is that to keep yourself open and to ask the monk like oh please explain us or what is good for you as well because it, especially there might be some differences in understanding between monks and again those differences are generally not so big uh, but yeah it is very good and I've seen it already and I was to some level surprised by it or more that I was curious how that would be but to see that you seem also comfortable with it that there might be different ways and uh, you're willing to adjust. So that's also nice because, again, we do the same as monks, like especially when it comes to offering food. There might be some differences in understanding and we try to just find a way, how do we do it together in a way? So we find harmony and uh, yeah, we avoid that we 
make that a, a reason for division, but instead we try to come together and see how can we practice together in a skillful way. So I think that is still the very most important, aside from all the details. Details can be helpful, but especially to come back to just a generally a good attitude towards the Vinaya. And I think in a way it can be just very human, like it doesn't even need to have to do with the Vinaya, but it's just a good quality to have as a human being, also towards your own conduct and towards your spiritual friends, to be open for feedback and also learn. I think it takes some time because sometimes the mind might be a little bit defensive or uh, to say if somebody gives us feedback it might hurt a little bit. But I think over time we can also learn to soften ourselves. So if somebody gives us feedback, that we actively like soften our own mind so that we can receive it. Because yeah, not just with this, but in general, like it's very great if people give us feedback, and uh, we can really learn from that a lot. So and that way, if we stay open to each other, we can do that in a proper way. Yeah. yeah so I think that's all from my side. So feel free if there are any questions. Yeah. Testing, testing. Otherwise, somebody can come and fetch this. Testing, testing. Uh, Bante, just now you were saying that you no. Know, uh, to, to pick a monk, as we see, to fetch a monk, there was one guy and one lady. What happened if there is two lady? Uh, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> um, yeah, so whether there is one lady, two, or one hundred, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, like we maybe we can distinguish between kind of a human level and uh, and the Vinaya. So, in the Vinaya, there is no distinction. It's just that, of course, like it might feel a bit like that as a human being. We can understand that if there's one man together with a woman, it might be a bit more a difficult situation or risky for the defilements. But if there are more women, it might indeed be a bit more uh, safeguarded in a way. But just in the Vinaya, there's no such distinction. Uh, yeah, so one one lady or many is the same situation. So we always need to be make sure. So that's when there is a car, when we are picked up in a car, we always make sure there's a man, yeah. What happens if there is no men are free and all our ladies are free? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> yeah, so then the monk needs to walk, I think. Sorry? <laughs> the monk will need to walk. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> or find another mode of transport, but yeah, that's okay. not a, a factor that makes a difference, yeah. Okay. Even though, yeah, it can sometimes happen, I can understand that, yeah, uh, that situation can happen, especially I've seen it with Dana where uh, of, often it's more the ladies who are helping out with dana. The men are somehow a bit hard to motivate. <laughs> yeah, but area. because uh, what happened if uh, is the monk who are very sick and need help and at the moment you have only lady around, mm. no monk. Yeah. Were the lady allowed to bring the monk to the hospital or to the clinic to see the doctors? Yeah, so in the Vinaya there, so this is a bit of a uh, different topic. So one is maybe like non-urgent travel. Sorry? <laughs> so maybe there are, there are two categories in a way. So one is non-urgent travel. So let's say I'm just arriving and, oh yeah, I want to go to BGF at some point. Mm. But let's say if somebody has really a medical emergency, mm. that somebody is dying. I mean, it, there's no exception actually in the Vinaya for that. Uh, mm. So technically speaking, if let's say I'm dying and there is a, a team, an ambulance coming with only women. So mm. maybe the chance of that happening is somewhat small. Generally, yeah, there might be a bit of a distribution of men and women mm. in such teams. Uh, so, but technically speaking, I would get an offense in the Vinaya if I would travel. The question is also like if I'm not conscious, if I'm really dying, then uh, of course it might be that I'm not aware of it, but I would technically still have an offense. Yeah. Actually, yeah, yeah. Like not for making the arrangement, let's say if I'm really dying and I'm not conscious, mm -hmm. then I would not have an offense for making the arrangement, but by traveling just with a woman, if there are just women in the ambulance, that would still be an offense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
But just because uh, there was no exception made by the Buddha for that, we don't know how it went in that time. I don't think they had, I don't know what would happen, like the healthcare system was not so well developed at that time. So I don't know if there was the luxury of an ambulance if you would have uh, serious problems. But so there are no exceptions for this, yeah. <laughs> uh, no exception. Okay, thanks. What about nurses? In, um, over here in Malaysia, majority of the nurses are female nurses. Um, we won't, hardly, you do get male nurses. So what happens? What would be the, depends on the situation, like, so now there are many nurses and I'm here, there's no problem. What, what situation would you mean, what is your question about? If Bante is admitted in the hospital, mm. And the nurses are the caregivers. So would Bante be able to receive treatment? Yeah, so maybe it's a topic that I didn't fully touch, uh, touch upon yet. So hmm. Yeah, so the hospital can be a bit difficult but more in the sense that, for example, in Sri Lanka, and I think in Thailand as well, they have hospitals for monks, so then one of the difficulties with if you need to go to the hospital, let's say you're really like admitted to the hospital, that uh, you it might be difficult to avoid laying down with a woman because there might be women in the hospital if you're in a regular hospital. So again, like, yeah, the question is if you're really not conscious, it might just happen even if you're, you cannot stop it. <laughs> you might end up in the hospital and you wake up in the hospital. And uh, so one, one way also to do is that if you lay down, there can also be adjustments made to the bed so that you're not laying down completely flat, but you're a bit more like upright. So actually, the, uh, Tanutamo and myself, we have had that situation one time. We were traveling to Sri Lanka, and at that time, due to COVID lockdowns, we needed to stay in a quarantine when we arrived in, uh, in uh, Colombo. And then at some point, the, it became clear that in the beginning, we thought we were going to a place where there were only monks. And then, it, but it turned out that it wasn't, there was just all kinds of people. <laughs> and uh, so also we started to see that, oh, there seems reasonable that there are also women in the building, uh, sleeping in the same building. <laughs> Thank you for the reminder. So it, in that case, it was also reasonable that yeah, there are women in the building. And at that, to that time, uh, also Tanutomo, he first, and myself, I also joined later. We realized that since there are women in the building probably, then what we did is we put the mattress kind of up high and you just kind of don't lay down fully flat. The same in a hospital bed, you can keep it a bit upright. Uh, so that will be in regard to laying down. So then one topic I didn't fully touch upon, and it's maybe, it doesn't need to be a word of, of a word play, but it is about touching. So generally when we're in the hospital, like we try to ask for male nurses or male doctors, especially if they're doing like a physical examination. Uh, yeah, also just for ourselves, for our practice, that can be more more wise or more skillful. So we always try, if possible, to do it in that way. Uh, among doctors, there's also a distribution. There's both men and women. So often, yeah, in some cases, there might be there might be a woman doctor who's more has more skills. So you would, but then you would still ask, like, can there be a man who can do the examination as well? And then in regard to nurses, it might be that if we're really in the hospital with problems, that they need they will end up touching us sometimes, or they might like give us a medicine or put like. You know, put some injection or something like that. It depends also how much care we need. Like, it depends if you're really unconscious and they need to really take care of everything. We So we would try to avoid it. And uh, I think in most cases it can. So at the same time, if you would really be there, it's good to be aware that for us as monks, there are no rules that we can absolutely not touch a woman, a woman or women in general. It has been a bit of a practice in general in some monks, monks, that they have, that they they have it comes more from the commentaries where there is a, a principle called untouchables. So what they say is that there are certain things that we should never touch. So uh, women are one of them. I think money is one of them. There are more untouchables. Gems. So I think like like money and women are the most important ones. And then there is maybe some wisdom in it in that in general we try to avoid contact. I mean also with men, like we just generally avoid uh, physical contact. Uh, we don't really 
generally is not really needed. Um, but then the thing is, like, so this is an interesting case where you can see that if he would be in the hospital and a nurse is treating us, so she needs to give us an injection, if she would give me an injection, that would not be an offense for me. The only thing is, if a monk would have lust, so the mind has lust, and then he would try from that mind state, would touch a woman, that would be an offense. So technically speaking, of course, we try to be wise and can be extra careful, but it would not be a venial offense in and by itself if we are touched by a woman. So it's more like a, a practice in many Buddhist countries to maybe be extra safe, that oh, we try to avoid any touch, but it would not be a venial offense in and by itself, only if I would have an unskillful state and I would wish to touch from that unskillful state. But again, like if I would be in a hospital, it is fine if a nurse would give me an injection, for example, yeah. So I think generally, even if you end up in the hospital, like this is what I mean for myself when I, when I wanted to ordain, I really investigated the Vinaya quite deeply to see like oh, what are the aspects and then how would that work in real life. And it is actually really impressive because it's quite an old text, but to see like many rules, they have like kind of many like additional factors or things that would not be an offense. So it's actually very balanced, especially knowing that it's like 2,600 years old and then to see like there are often like there's a rule but there are also like yeah there are also many exceptions that make it very balanced in a way so that but sometimes it's also not to be avoided because of course i mean it seems that in the buddha's time we did there was not that kind of health care that we have today so we still can get into situations where yeah it is sometimes difficult we don't have exactly high guidance from the vinaya in that case but so even if we would end up in the hospital generally uh, we should we should be able to even be free from vinaya offenses and maybe also heal again if we can, and be healthy again as well. Thank you, Bhante. Yeah. Maybe before we go to the next question, maybe just to add something about this that I, I, I realized I haven't touched upon, but can be maybe a good addition to this part. It, it also namely comes up when we offer food. Also again, the question of like, what happens when a woman would touch a monk? So also here, it is a bit of a subtle, subtle topic in a way, but I've seen it sometimes that with the offering of food, that there can be sometimes a bit of nervousness. So anyways, one of the challenges is that, so it's very meritorious and wholesome to offer something. So we, we wish that that is possible to do that. That is very good. But then especially, I think both for men and women, but maybe for women a bit more, uh, in the sense that like a woman and a man, there's always a bit more, we're a bit more careful and we're a bit more sens sensitive to, to that situation. Uh, not as monks even, but uh, also just as general men and women in the world, there's a certain like sense of shame and kind of carefulness and things that are proper and not proper towards each other. Uh, maybe just as, as human beings as well, there are just some things where, yeah, that go quite deep where we realize that oh, yeah, we, what is proper or not. So then when offering food, it's interesting because sometimes there can be the principle that you avoid touching a monk, which can be something you decide to do, uh, which is really fine. Um, but also it can lead to nervousness when you offer something, especially if we do dish by dish. It can happen sometimes you give something to a monk and there's some, that the hands can be quite close together. So it can be that incidentally you touch a monk. So it's also good to clarify that in that case, that would not be an offense for a monk, except if, except if the monk would have lust and would act out of that lust. So I think this is also sometimes why the monks want to be extra careful because they don't always know maybe some lust arises and uh, they want to be extra careful with that, but yeah, I think the chances of that are very small. So generally, as monks, we keep the mind wholesome. <laughs> and then if you would offer something and maybe the hands would touch, that would not necessarily be an offense for the monk. Generally, that would not be an offense. So it's also good, like, I, I notice it sometimes that it's a difficult balance maybe to make because, of course, we want to be careful and, uh, how to say, give each other space and, and uh, avoid unnecessary contact, but it's also good to yeah, be confident and feel okay that you can offer something and also if you would incidentally touch. I think to me, like I've been here five weeks, maybe it happened twice or so. Uh, so it also doesn't happen so much that that incidentally happens. And uh, so just also to assure you that if that would happen by incident, there's also no big problem. And we just do our best to be careful and do it in a proper way, but also to kind of yeah, be reasonable and also friendly to ourselves that we're doing our best and we're also not perfect. <laughs> Yeah, so that's a point that I wanted to just clarify for a moment. Now, next question. <laughs> I was just wondering how how would you explain the best way, or what are the conditions when a monk can say, 
what he needs. Because when I have been a monk myself in the past, sometimes I met people who thought, oh, he doesn't need anything. So a uh, question didn't come up. Or they were thinking, he's not allowed under no circumstance to say anything what he needs, either food or some items. So what are the conditions under which a monk can say what he actually needs? Yeah, good question, because normally when we, maybe I, I still summarize a bit, so Danutmo is asking about under what conditions can we as monks ask for certain things that we might need. So generally this comes under the categories of maybe food, requisites, or ropes, or accommodation. <laughs> so under what circumstances can we as monks ask about this? So generally, maybe just from, from the Dhamma itself, we would be quite careful and we try to ask as little as we can, try to be easy as possible to support. Um, so in general, I think we are a bit restrained in this uh, context. Um, and at the same time, so I think there are different ideas that are there about what is proper or not. Um, so maybe the most the most clear way is if people really tell us, like, oh, Bante, if you, uh, how to say, to be very, very specific, like, oh, Bante, if you need any... Um, any any house or any flight ticket or to the hospital or whatever you need, please tell me, and then 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 you then you are really assured that if you ask those things, it is not a burden to those people. Like I think it tries to avoid also that when people say people might say, "I want to let me know if you need something," and then I say like, "Oh, maybe you can get me a, a private jet to to America tomorrow," and then of course like people might even feel kind of that it's difficult to say no to a monk. So then. We try to avoid that situation in general where yeah, we have yeah, we put some pressure and people end up maybe having a bit of resentment like all these monks, they're very hard to, uh, hard to support and they, they have many wishes. <laughs> so, so I think that's one way that sometimes people might specifically express that they want to help and what they want to help with. And uh, that can help. And another category that is there is that if we perceive that there is sickness, we can also ask. So we... We can we can ask from anyone if we need any medicine. So uh, so also somebody who has not expressed that we that they're willing to support us, we can still ask them like, oh, I really need this medicine uh, or this medical treatment. And uh, one that I was thinking about this morning that can that I find myself sometimes challenging a bit in the category of traveling is that sometimes we might travel and then like one thing that is easier if you have money is that generally it's a bit harder these days to find water to drink like. I don't know how it was in the Buddha's time, but I have this romantic idea that there were streams everywhere and you could drink from it. I don't know if it was really like that. And uh, I mean, for example, in Europe, in the where I'm from, generally you can drink tap water everywhere. So it's a bit more easy. And also most people or most monks, they would consider that from a point of the Vinaya, okay, that drinking water, you don't need to get offered. But people are sometimes, or monks are sometimes a bit more unsure about bottled water because it's not... It's not exactly just water from the tap. It has a bit more value to it. So I think, actually, I'm not fully decided myself, but you can see it as well. Like if you're very thirsty, if you feel pain from the thirst, <laughs> you might also be able to ask as well for a bottle of water uh, or ask somebody if they can help you get some drinking water in some way. Uh, but so generally, we try to kind of limit it to when we're sick, we have some sick sickness, and we would need some medicine or, in this case, I think water can be seen under that as well. I think there might be different interpretations of it, but especially if there's really pain from the thirst, it can be reasonable that yeah, to ask for, oh, please can you maybe help me find some drinking water to drink. Um, yeah, so it is something something good to keep in mind. Hmm. I've had it sometimes that when I go for a treatment or I go somewhere or when you travel a lot, that it can be difficult because you might be a bit hesitant to ask for something, but then I've sometimes been very grateful if somebody would offer me a little bit of water or <laughs> because then, yeah, one might themselves be a bit hesitant in asking for it. But then, yeah, if you see a monk, you can always, if you wish, you can check if they might be thirsty and uh, a little bit of water might be helpful. Yeah, yeah. yeah th that would be a way. It's just that the amount of water, if you have a long trip, like the amount of water, or generally at least myself, the amount of water you might drink in a day or an afternoon, afternoon or a day, it might be a bit too much to carry around. And so surely it can help, but yeah, you might not always, especially after long trips, like some people might fly for 24 hours, like you generally maybe a bit too much water to bring. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, I can speak for all the monks, and maybe some, they carry a bottle, of course, but it's just that in general, like, as human beings, we need to drink quite something, and also food we need. And for both, depends maybe how you see it, but most monks would not really ask for it. So it's maybe especially, it's a good point, I think it's especially when we travel a bit longer, then it can be good to, if it's still within the proper time, uh, in regard to food, and in regard to water, then just any time, you to just if you feel comfortable you can always just ask basically like uh do you need some water it can <laughs> can be kind of nice but of course it's not your responsibility but it's more good to realize that yeah generally the body needs water over over time so <laughs> and and, uh, and most monks might be a bit hesitant to ask so <laughs> they're sometimes a bit shy maybe you if you don't mind you can share maybe also a bit in general because for tanutamo it might be certain reasons or a certain case but might not be that his case is the same for all the monks. So maybe if you wish, can share yeah. besides your own experience also, maybe in general, what you've so, seen in other monks. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. as Bhante said, I cannot say for, I mean, probably there are as many reasons to disrobe as there are monks who do it, actually. But um, as far as I know from Western monks, usually the support is not really an issue in most cases from my experience and it was also not for me the support was not not really the issue for me it was just mainly the the wish to stay extended periods in nature so i just wanted to do a long term retreat so i mean there were many reasons some other reasons as well but that was the main reason and as a monk there's so many rules we have which would prevent that for example storing of food or cooking so this is something I couldn't do. And um, actually, in, in a sense, it is lack of support since I tried many times and Venerable even can testify as well to find conditions where I just could stay in the Kuti as a monk and just stay for just a limited period, maybe three months. We have some precedence even in the canon and to just do the retreat. But it was very hard to find. And so eventually I decided then after one year contemplation, I stayed almost seven years, seven was I had, and after one year I contemplated, okay, I want to try this path uh, of retreat in nature, and that was the main the main reason. Uh. And one thing also for me was, um, uh, it's a very serious matter to, to break the Vinaya rules, and some rules I, 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 I found, it's very, not easy to keep them very pure. So I thought always it's better to be a pure layperson than a, d a defiled monk. I, I wouldn't say I was defiled, but not 100%, I couldn't keep them. So that's the main, the main thing. Now. Maybe I can try to add something uh, more in general. Actually, I hope I remember, I, one time I heard a talk about this, because of course, as monks, we also think about this and actually more also from the practice of, I think, so for Tanutomo, there was a bit of a, for me, it's a bit of a special case, even though I'm sure there are more like that, that for Tanutomo, he wished more for a, a type of practice where you can stay a long time on your own. And in the Buddha's time, it was interesting, there's a story in the Vinaya where there was a monk and he was actually an arahant. And what he did is he would collect rice and he would dry it and then he would uh, heat it up himself. And then the Buddha, he uh, said not to do it. And the reason is that if all the monks would do it, like Tanutomo shared it, I think if some monks can do it, that, that could be good work, but the Buddha uh, said not to do it because if all the monks would do it, like I would not be here now maybe, or probably I would, but the idea would be that the connection with the laity would get lost because if we keep ourselves, it, it happens maybe, for example, uh, to my understanding in Zen, it's not uncommon that monks, they cook or they grow their own food and they cook and they eat their own food then. And in that way, like the relationship between the laity and the monks will get broken over time. Uh, and we, by making ourselves dependent on the dana, the alms food, we can uh, we can keep also. There's a bigger chance that we can keep a relationship. So the Buddha disallowed that because I think on a large scale he had some concerns. But then, yeah, it could be that on individual cases it could still be possible that an individual monk can be supported in that. But uh, I think that's what Tanutomo tried, but can still be difficult because most monasteries really built on that principle that you go on alms round. So that can be difficult to find. Yeah. Actually, sometimes I even tried, you know, because I saw the Buddha, sometimes he stayed for three months 
in solitude. And I always try to make the case na, that this is the precedence. So the Buddha repeatedly did that, and some monks as well. I'm not saying um, as a general, just few individual monks, but it's very hard to find the, the, this kind of solitude. No? Not to abolish the arms round as such, but just as an occasional practice. It was quite challenging to find. Actually. Just. Yeah. 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 Yeah, maybe just to add a little, I, I try to remember, but the memory doesn't come yet, but I remember there's one monk, he's quite nice, a uh, Western monk, and he made a series of talks, and one of the talks he spoke about this, and I think for some of us we try to recollect, why do monks this rope? <laughs> so sometimes as monks we try to recollect and understand why do other monks this rope? It can also help us to ourselves be careful not to this rope. So I think that, I mean, to my understanding, maybe what Anutomo shared, for there might be a bit more less common, I think. Some common ones are maybe a bit less. Like I think for Tanutamo, there was still the perception that this is a good practice for me and will help me on the path. So that still uh, has a lot of nobility in it. But I think sometimes the reasons why monks disrobe are not always noble, <laughs> or certainly mostly, I think, not noble. <laughs> and so I, what I remember from it is that so monks disrobe in a way, like in ways that you can just relate to often from sensual desire or from aversion. So sometimes as monks, we live together in a small group of monks. So what I see in a monastery is that it's like any community. I can also see it, no offense, but I can also see it. I can also see it amongst lay communities that you, as human beings together, we need to make hard work to work together in a good way and keep harmony. Because especially when we still have defilements in the mind, we need to really work actively together. And especially if we live with the same people a longer time, maybe you can see it with your family members uh, or close friends, like after a while you know each other so well, but you might also be more easily triggered and things build up maybe over time. And uh, so I think one of the reasons monks this rope is they get agitated with other monks or they have like, they start to look down on other monks and they have negative perceptions. So basically kind of aversion that's not balanced. And uh, the, then the idea might grow in the mind like, oh, as long as I can be away from these monks, I'll be happy. <laughs> But of course, in the end, it's our own mind. So <laughs> then if one might disrobe, one might see that the next community one also has troubles. But I think that's a big one. Just uh, uh, people find it difficult to live in a community. I think also one of the things that I've seen and that I've also heard that is not uncommon is that, I mean, one of the reasons more on the sensuality side is that, uh, so in this case, we're talking about monks. and But I, I'm, I'm sure it might also apply to nuns is that they get attracted to the opposite sex. So they meet a lay person and they get attracted and then they decide to disrobe to, for the purpose of a romantic life. I think that's also not uncommon if I, if I re recollect it correctly. And um, I think one of the things is also that when some of us ordain as monks, we might have certain ideas of what it is to be a monk. <laughs> and then when we are monks longer time, we can see also that there are certain expectations also like, for me also now, like it was not per se my idea to do a Dhamma talk now. Uh, I'm happy to do it. <laughs> but uh, sometimes like not all the monks are keen on teaching or sharing. Some might also be quite shy or not per se keen to, to speak in public. And if you really don't want it, it can, for example, be difficult because for me now, the main purpose I come to KL is to also get treatment. And then I'm, I am kind of happy to also be around you and share and learn and... Uh, but also it requires some work for me as well because I have some areas where I need to grow. And then like being a monk is not just like being in the forest and meditating. And for some monks, they realize that over time that there might be some expectations for them to teach a little bit or to share Dhamma or to do Anamodana. And there are some things that also being a monk in the larger Buddhist community, uh, we might not always know beforehand. And then I think that's also sometimes a reason that monks might see like, oh wait, maybe I'm, they might feel unsure or they might I decide to pursue another path. Yeah. So th to my understanding, those are some of the more important ones. And also just to realize that maybe, yeah, it's a bit difficult that I say that I'm the only monk in the room, but it's also not to be underestimated that it can be challenging. I think the holy life, if you live it properly, it can be very, very good and very agreeable to the mind. But it is also challenging in the sense that you try to maintain a high level of sila. So there can also, pressures can come with it. Like, there is, 
yeah, the defilements can be strong, so it is not per se the easiest path. I think for some more than others, depends on how strong are the defilements, but it is also not always the easiest path until you get skillful, more skillful, and you can make the most of it. But uh, it is also not to be underestimated that, yeah, it is quite a simple life, and it's not always easy either. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, day life is not easy, the life gone forth is not easy, they're both not easy in their own ways. But, yeah. Some other questions? Bhante, I have some Dharma friends who, I, whether it's because of circumstance or whether they want it that way, they would like to invite monks to offer dana at restaurants. Mm. So is that against the Vinaya? Mm. It's not really against the Vinaya, no. It's just that, like I think the consideration can be that there are different ways to look at it. <laughs> so one thing that we see in the suttas is that the Buddha, on some occasion, he became quite famous and well known. So sometimes he would be invited by kings, and they would give like a very big meal and uh, very luxurious. And the Buddha never said that we shouldn't do that, and I. If I remember correctly, the Buddha even spoke on it once that he would advise us that even if it's the best meal that we get, like in a way it doesn't matter, like we should be able to keep the mind wholesome and not be kind of swayed by it. So in a way, whether we get something very simple or we get like the most luxurious uh, food that is maybe considered the best food in the world, in a way as monks, ideally we should not have a preference either which is sometimes counterintuitive because people might think that all oh, monks, they should be very restrained and simple, but simplicity can also mean that even if somebody is very rich and they offer you very luxurious food, that also you're not going to make a problem out of it either. So you're not going to tell him no, like you're not going to take away his chance to give dana either. So from that perspective, like it would not be an offense in the Vinaya and we ideally we also don't reject it. Um, I do myself sometimes... For myself, I've, I've been, the last weeks I've been to a restaurant only a few times. And for me personally, I feel quite awkward as a monk sitting in the middle of a restaurant. Maybe that's also okay that I feel awkward, but I think from one end, like, it doesn't feel so fitting. But again, then part of it is maybe just to also be okay that now I sit here and I have some luxurious food and then I eat it and it's finished again and then I go on. Um, yeah. I don't have, a, so from the Vinaya, it's okay. Personally, from a point of Dhamma, so ideally we should also not reject it, so we should like allow for food to be given. Generally, it's quite nice. I like also the setup that is here. The most simple way that we like to do, but it's a bit more difficult in Malaysia, is just to go to from house to house. So we walk out of the door and we, whoever is cooking, we, uh, we ask something from them, or we walk there and they give us something. I've experienced that in Sri Lanka, and then what I would do is I stayed near to a, clo near to a small village, and in Sri Lanka, what people do, or at least where I was, and I had the idea that it's quite common, especially in more in villages, is people just, and I imagine that that was how it was more in the Buddha's time, that people would just cook something in the morning and they eat it throughout, throughout the day. So then if you come as a monk in the morning, they have food already prepared, and they give something of, of their food to you. And then if you go the next day, they know you're there, so then they start preparing nice food. So some monks, what they do is then they don't go to those houses, and they go to other houses where it's more a surprise again. And that way is very pure in a way that you really just eat what the people themselves eat, and it's very nice. At the same time, again, so the Buddha did encourage us that also if there's really luxurious food, if the king invites us, um, that also we, we would accept it. We won't say, like, no, that's too luxurious, like, we're ascetic. Because, yeah, also for the king, the king would also, that would also not be fair that he doesn't have a chance just because he's offering something that's more, more, uh, more luxurious. So ideally, we stay open to whatever. Um, of course, as a, yeah, I don't know what to say of it if I should. Yeah, again, for me personally, when I've gone to those restaurants, sometimes I feel a bit old about it. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, my other question is, in a situation like that where you're offered dana in a restaurant, uh, are you allowed to sit in the same table with the lady? I'm trying to remember what the Vinaya says and what is a common practice. So I think a common practice would be that we avoid. So the times I've been taken out, generally I sit alone on the table. And generally, anyways, as monks, we avoid that we sit even with other monks. Uh, 
we generally try to just sit on our own and just eat by ourselves and not to make eating like a social event but just something that you do on your own uh, even like so here for example I mean I mainly have been here on my own but other places sometimes when we s are with a few monks we might eat together even though we sit in silence and uh, but even that is yeah, for example, in SBS, when we have a we have a period where we have some activity together, and we might eat together then as well. But we also have a period where there's no schedule, and then everyone just eat on their own. Um, and the idea is that maybe you can do both. But uh, yeah, so generally it's just to be avoided. But to my understanding, I don't think it's a vinaya offense. I'm trying to remember. Like I think it might be. Is it that when you sit on a bench together, it could be an offense with a lay layperson? Like it might be, for example, when you share a seat, the same seat, like maybe in a McDonald's or something where you have like a bench like that, then you would avoid sitting on that. Uh, but I think technically if you sit on a table and you have separate chairs, it wouldn't be an offense. Yeah. Uh, it, so yeah, that would, that would be okay from that point of view, but still, especially like the, the trouble with it is more that it doesn't seem very like uh, renunciate, especially like we avoid to have like a social meal like that. Also in the monastery, even when we're in the monastery, just monks, we avoid that we sit together and talk while we eat, for example. So we, uh, it's less a social event, it's just something that we, we eat. Yeah. So that would be the main concern. But from a point of an eye, it could still be okay, but generally, yeah, could be proper to give the monk some space to eat on his own. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Bhante. Mm -hmm. Do you have a press? Okay, can, can I just say something? Um, this inviting uh, monastics to a restaurant seems to me like um, a lack of understanding of, you know, um, what monastics are supposed to be or are practicing or the practice of a, monast a monastic. Because um, what it really is is that Monastics are actually practicing for sense restraint, right, for simplicity. But if you invite them to a place which is pretty much, you know, just eating for indulgence, eating for um, luxury or whatever it is, then I would think that there is a kind of lack of understanding of the Dhamma. Would that be right to say? Um, I mean, it would make it difficult for the monastic to, to say, okay, if I invite you, um, it would make it difficult for you to say say no. But at the same time, it, that's, that's not really what you want, is it? I mean, not, not something that you would necessarily feel um, that you want to do. Yeah, I think I see what you're pointing at is that and that's maybe also what I meant is that it doesn't fit so much the image of a monk, especially yeah. like yeah. It might be all to see a monk in a restaurant. But like for me and there, I really take the suttas as my source. So I do think that ideally, yeah, I find it a complicated topic in that sense is that ideally like sense restraint is not hmm, like we need to eat to survive. So on some level, it can also become an attachment that you can only eat very simple things because we might not always have the luxury to eat simple things. So sometimes like people offer things. I mean, even if I stay here or anywhere else, the food, restaurant food is not always per se, sometimes it's good, but maybe not as a good taste. But sometimes also when you stay with people, some people might have very good cooking skills and like sense restraint is not necessarily about avoiding good food because you, you will get, it's more about being able to eat the food and reflect on it in a way and have clarity on it in a way in your mind that lust will not arise while you eat it. So then you can eat the best foods, but you're just not... Uh, okay, I'm uh, not saying it's your fault, but I'm just saying that, you know, the, the, the person that's offering should, I think, consider that it might make it difficult for the uh, monk to... Um, I mean, yeah, what, I, what I can understand from what you maybe point at is that you can... Yeah, it's difficult, like, you can indeed, like, make the consideration that how to say to bring a monk into an environment that is most conducive to their practice. For me, it's also just like, indeed, surely, like, there are more aspects to a restaurant because there might be like, 
for me, it's not per se generally, an, uh, how to say, if as a monk you like living in the forest and you like a bit more quiet, then generally like a restaurant with, it's not just the food, but generally there's music, there's yeah. many people around that are kind of coming and going. Yeah, that's what so it might in generally not be a too conducive environment. Of course, like we don't come to KL because it's such a <laughs> conducive environment. And how to say we don't come to KL to deepen our meditation because it's more quiet here than the forest. But so yeah, I, I can see your point that it can be a consideration to keep it a bit simple also in support of the monk. Um, actually for me as a monk, it depends a bit. Let's see if I can say something general. That's always a bit risky because it's normally not that simple. But I do think that if, for me, when I'm being offered something that somebody cooked themselves with a lot of effort, and you can see that when somebody, I know in SBS, we have a dana group where we go there for dana, and uh, I, I, you can recognize, you can see that some of the uh, uh, donors that are coming there, I can see that they put a lot of effort in their food and what they make. And for me, that's that's generally more kind of heartwarming and supportive to the practice. That, um, yeah, it depends. You can also like with a lot of care select a restaurant and find like food that is suitable in the restaurant for the monk or set it up in a way that is proper. So I think either way can work. But yeah, it is not necessarily that that which is more expensive is also more conducive to the practice of a monk. But yeah, it, it is so that for us it would be difficult to really. We also don't want to reject it in that way. I mean, there might be some limits, like, yeah, there might be some venues or some, like, if, if somebody would take me to a bar or something, like, there might be some limits in the kind of venues where you might say, like, this is really not appropriate, even though, yeah. So, I, yeah, I, I see your point. It's just that as monks, we're generally a bit careful with setting many boundaries for people because, yeah, we try to stay easy to support. So if somebody wishes to bring us somewhere and, yeah, we would not object. But, of course, there are some... Yeah, I think when you give, I mean, you give dana, there are different levels of purification of what you give, and you can yourself consider, yeah, what, how do you want to do it, basically. <laughs> Sorry, I just did a bit of sharing on uh, bringing monk to the uh, restaurant. Uh, I have a, a friend who actually uh, wished to bring the dharma to the, I mean, to the families. The families are not a Buddhist, and for them. For, for them to like, uh, you know, uh, go to the temples, offers to monks and waiting for the monks to eat really, then only they eat. They are not used to that. So at the end, in orders to, uh, I mean, uh, in orders to bring the, uh, I mean, to give opportunities to the families to offer. So they end up bringing the monks to the restaurants. Okay, so, and they sit down together with the monks and the monks know that the intentions of that ladies. Okay, it's not just because of uh, offering a uh, luxurious uh, food to the monks, but then it's more towards to give opportunities for the families to offer the dana. At the same time, don't have that type of negative uh, thoughts. Because uh, every time when she brings the, 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 the uh, families to perform dana in the temple, when they came back to the house, they will make a lot of noise, which is very negative. So she say instead of, uh, uh, you know, uh, she also don't want to see the families to have that type of uh, thought. And, uh, that's where they arrange to bring the monks to the, to the restaurants. And it works well for the monks and for the families. Okay. Then the other, uh, most of the time I saw is that actually a lot of uh, monks that who brought to, I mean, most of the devotees bring the monks to the restaurants are Tibetan monk or Mahayanese monk. You see, Tibetan monk, when they came from overseas, they might not have the support like Theravada monk where you have the center. Most of the time they might just land and go to someone's house. And for that person to cook for the monks, it might be more, uh, I mean, more effort. Or maybe if they bring the monks to go outside where they can actually ask a few fans to come and join them, and uh, they will have uh, that type of... Uh, it's also offerings, but to Tibetan monks, they are all right. Okay, so I, if you see a, it's, it's, a Theravada monk is less, it, less people bring them to the restaurant. Most of us, we know that you know, when we offer, we will bring to the temple. Okay, but... Uh, Tibetan monk most of the time, or Mahayadis monk, 
you can see that they bring and the devotee bring them to the restaurant is out of uh, their devotion. It's not to say that you know for the monks to have a very luxury food, everything. It's actually a offering, but different type of offering itself, you know. Because there is no, if you look at the Tibetan monk or Mahayanin monk, they don't have this type of tradition where you bring foods to offer to the monk. They cook themselves or they, they you know, sometimes devotee just invite them to go out. Okay. Maybe one point that I would like to share on this category or this theme is that I, I do see, I think, the point in what Kit was trying to share that even though we might have wholesome intentions, it is also good. Uh, one monk that I met when I came to KL, he said the famous words, uh, also monks are humans. And he was, he was speaking that maybe we should take care of uh, monks' rights as well, like human rights. It is also good, I think there can be a wholesome intent, like I've seen it with my parents or my family who are not Buddhist, and they also have not so much interest in it, that especially in the very beginning I was trying to really convert them, and oh, like how, how great the Dhamma, didn't really work. <laughs> And I think many of us have that interest, and it's very nice to try and share the Dhamma. But also, I think we there's also an art in finding the balance, because as monks, like we also try to keep our practice going. And it is, I think, as monks, we, we have the most value also to you if we can have our time to meditate and practice. And we should also avoid that we're taken to restaurants for those who have maybe very little faith, and otherwise might not come and see us or might have interest, and that we are brought to them just so that it's easier for them. It might also be a consideration that that costs also energy and time for the monk. And the Buddha also, he said that, of course, ideally we wish to help everyone, but uh, there's also a limitation in time and energy, so it is also good to consider that if people are not willing to come, like what we're doing now is a very wholesome way, and for me I'm very happy that we spend our time like this, like we speak about very important things, and we share with the intention to learn, but especially if somebody ha doesn't have faith in the Dhamma, just their mind is inclined in such different directions, which is really okay, but it's generally not so very fruitful. Like, yeah, for my parents, even if you would bring 2,000 monks to their house, uh, I think they wouldn't really like it, to be honest. If I would come, they would be happy, but just to say that if people don't have that faith, they also don't have so much benefit from it. So it is good to keep in mind, like, as monks, we're very happy because we get a lot of support as well. So that's that kind of common relationship uh, that... Yeah, the same if you have very good friends and you would maybe, I had that when I was a layman, I had very good friends and I would like my friends to meet other friends because I thought they would like each other and they would benefit from each other. But then also sometimes we need to take care that the friend that we like, we also yeah, not push them too far or pull them too far because again, yeah, as monks, we might not always say no, but yeah, might, sometimes there can be many questions and we need to keep a balance as well. So especially those who might not be so interested, yeah, it's also okay in a way. Like, yeah, of course, ideally, Everyone is interested in the Dhamma, but yeah, then, yeah, then samsara would not be there anymore. Who would take care of samsara? Yeah. Uh, Bobby, before we end, are you satisfied with your request that you uh, made? I'm, I'm not sure whether Bante covered the area where, if let's say there's a single female that wants to offer dana at a Buddhist center. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, maybe we can uh, wrap up with that, yeah. So I think I, I shared some aspects that are related, but that particular effect, indeed, no, we didn't talk about it. So I think what I shared is that, yeah, it's a good point because we spoke, for example, about if you travel in a car, you cannot travel just with a woman together. And uh, so then there are two more situations that are relevant. So one is the offering of dana. So generally, so one aspect is the vinaya, and there's also just generally kind of customs and what is seen as appropriate. So. Technically speaking, if you would just come to offer dana, especially because you're standing up, like if you're standing up as a man and a woman together, there is no any offense for the Vinaya. Of course, you want to check your mind to see what you're doing makes sense and is wholesome, and uh, not that you're kind of trying to create a situation. Like even within the Vinaya, you could do, live a very unwholesome life if you want, because the Vinaya cannot cover everything. <laughs> so, but generally, let's say if I'm here on my own, and one woman or a few women would come and they would offer food, there would not be any offense for me in it. Like you. Um, you would offer it and give it that there's no any problem. The only thing where sometimes there can be some limitations that we can consider, even theoretically speaking, you could even, yeah, that's already a bit on the edge. So what we generally try to avoid is to sit down together or to lie down, but uh, that would, the lying down is not so likely to happen. Um, but if we are together, so you offer down and there are really only women. I had that before when I stayed 
in, uh, in another place where that situation would almost arise sometimes and we discuss it as well how to do it at that time and then what we propose is that normally now we sit down after we after there's Dana we have some Animodana and maybe some reflections and then if it would only be women generally we try to avoid that so we try to avoid as a monk to only sit down with only women so in that case like standing up is okay like standing up is not so comfortable so you generally it doesn't last so long and it's just like okay you could still do a Animodana and then depart uh, but generally you avoid to sit down together um, that would be most appropriate, yeah. Yeah, so that's in general also like now when we sit down, it's generally most appropriate if you sit down with a monk to also make sure that there's always a man present. So now there, there are a few men here and there. <laughs> and uh, even if there are multiple women, generally we only sit down when there's one man, uh, at least. <laughs> and um, so that's also a situation where if you would sit down only with a, if you want to sit down only with a monk, to make sure ideally there's another man. For a monk it would only be an offense if he really tries to make that situation. So if he's just sitting and you sit down with him, it would not be directly an offense. But generally the monk would try to avoid that situation and try to make sure there's also a man present. I think the idea is if you sit down, it's a bit more like comfortable and you can really spend a lot of time talking. And I think the consideration for men and women is that sometimes this is also maybe the reason why sometimes monks disrobe is because uh, a monk gets very like familiar with a lay woman and they sit down a lot and they talk and it also can just look a little bit odd in some ways. So also to k take care of the perception to make sure what you do is also perceived by others as appropriate. Yeah. Satisfactory? Yep. Okay. Thank you, Bandi. Mathieu, would you like to share merits since we have uh, done so much good? So maybe you can take a moment to close your eyes or you can also keep them open. But just to take a moment to think about the sharing that we've done in the last while. How wholesome it is that we come together and we discuss the Dhamma and the Vinaya and we try to maintain a harmonious and skillful way that as laity and monks we support each other to make sure that the sasana can remain for a long time. And then you can also bring to mind maybe friends or family or whoever comes to mind, both those who we meet every day who are still alive and also those who have already passed away. You can bring them to mind. And you might even want to just invite any being. Sometimes there are some departed relatives from the past or Devas who would like to be here with us and you can invite them as well to to join us and to rejoice in the wholesome activities that we've undertaken in the last hour and a half, two hours. And we can bring to mind that whatever beings are there with us also just the people that we meet every day, that if we develop our mind, if we do wholesome things, we also can have a good impact on others and generally we directly or indirectly support them as well to live as wholesome as possible. And as a more formal way to mark as well our sharing of merit in that way, by inviting those beings so that they can rejoice and in their way also do, do wholesome things. To do the more formal part as well, we can recite together. Maybe we can just recite together. Idang me nyati nang ho tu sukita on tu nyata yo. Irang no nyati nang utu sukita on tu nyata yo. Irang wo nyati nang ho tu sukita on tu nyata yo. Etta wata chamei 
Sambadang punya sambadang, sape sata nu modan tu, sape sampati sitia. Maybe we can also together refresh and strengthen our aspiration for nirvana, and that we do this wholesome activity so that we can have a joyful and happy mind, and create the supportive conditions for seeing our experience clearly as it is, and to free ourselves from suffering uh, over time. <laughs> Sometimes we need some time for it. So, But still we, maybe together, can recite to recollect and bring to the mind again our aspiration for Nibbana, to not yeah, forget that context, forget, to not forget what we are aiming at. Idang me punyang asavakkaya Vahang ho tu, idang me punyang, nibbanasa, pachayo, ho tu, sadhu.